Hello and welcome to Bodyholic with D, episode number 12. My name is Dee Katz Shachar. I am a public health promoter. I attained my MPH from Tel Aviv University on the research track. I'm a fitness trainer with over 17 years of experience and I hold specializations in corrective exercise, women's fitness, and Pilates. I am also the founder and trainer of Bodyholic, the global health and fitness platform and community. I'm the author of Rip It Up For Good, and this podcast is a part of my effort and mission as a public health professional because I believe that real science-based information and knowledge is power, and my job in this life is to empower you. I want you to have high and sustained energy throughout the day, and I want you to feel better than you've ever felt before, during, and after your workouts, in and out of your clothing. And I also want you to feel good, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. Today's guest is the latest version of Paul Long. And I say this because Paul calls his guide and platform New Way Forward. He, he describes it as Paul Long's life version 4.0. So version one being youth and third generation storyteller. He grew up in the news business. Version two, award-winning major market television news reporter, anchor, weatherman, and special projects producer. Version three, Emmy award winning content creator for Paul Long Productions. He created and produced just about every kind of film and video you can think of for major companies. He won the Emmy for Best Documentary, A Passing of the Torch. Version 4, New Way Forward is Paul's new way forward, bringing to bear all his experience, skill, and talent, as well as what he has learned himself and from thought leaders over the past 15 years on what it takes to live a life with joy, purpose, passion, and income. Kick back and enjoy the interview because Paul has a passion for life and a strong sense of purpose that is absolutely contagious. So without further ado, here's the interview. Paul Long, how are you today? Vertical and uh, feeling well, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, I oh, love that. My first part of gratitude in the morning, I woke up. Right, and and, but, and you were vertical. That's, That's right, yeah. Amazing, amazing. This is why we connect. I love your attitude. <laughs> it starts with the basics. <laughs> <laughs> there are several hundred thousand people who didn't this morning, so... Yeah. We're the great fortune. Paul, the first thing I want us to get into is I I would like you to share with us, please, how you managed to get into health, longevity. And I I feel like when I read your stuff and I have spoken to you before, you are just all health. You're the, you're the poster child of health and longevity. <laughs> you know what? I appreciate that because I'll, I'll give you a secret. I'm trying to, if that's part of my why is to, to be the poster guy uh, for well, being healthy period, plus redefining, uh, actually bringing about the new reality of what's possible in olderhood uh, which is kind of where all this started. So uh, I know we don't have a two-hour program, so I'll try to keep it kind of short. But what happened was, first of all, was about 13, 14 years ago, actually a little bit longer than that, I was coming out of a very toxic situation, toxic, toxic very difficult business situation, toxic relationship, just too much going on. And I was being toxic with my health. And it was like, oh my gosh, look in the mirror. And, you know, I was watching a program and it was Dr. Daniel Amen, who's kind of the brain doctor. He's got a number of books out and things of that sort. And, and he, he had these 
two slides up of all this healthy food and all this we know not healthy food. And he's like, look, it's simple. Eat a lot of this as much as you want and don't eat any of this or just eat a little bit of it. So to jump ahead, I started taking baby steps. I'm not one of those super disciplined, perfect people. In fact, I'll fail if I even try to. Mm -hmm. So I just started eating a lot more of the really good stuff and a lot less of the bad stuff. And I, I, I started getting momentum. I started feeling the effects of it. And then I started looking, I, I started becoming more and more interested in it. I started getting into it. So I was, you know, if you read James Clear's Atomic Habits, I was atomic meaning little bitty habits that built into big habits. That's what I was doing. I was doing, instead of 10,000 steps a day, I was doing 10,000 baby steps. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is that one of the things I got into to recover from that situation I'd come from is that every morning I was meditating and I was doing yoga, stretching. Um, and while I was doing yoga, I put on people on YouTube and listen, interviews, speeches, stuff like that on all kinds of issues, you know, uh, success in business, spirituality, but health. And I really got into and was really stunned by what I was learning about not only what goes on with us when we're being unhealthy, but more what you can do. And this really what I thought was new way of thinking and approaching health. And that became the why. Why does this work? Why is it that when I do intermittent fasting or a hot and cold shower or just even a little bit of a workout and on and on and on actually makes us healthier? And I was really surprised with the answers that I got, which intrigued me and really just ended up making me buy into it. The last point, which I'm happy to discuss, but the yeah. last thing was a quote that I heard from Dr. Stephen Gundry, former president of the American Heart Association, cardiologist, how he turned his, his father's health around. A lot of us don't eat glutens and lectins. But uh, a quote of his Longevity Paradox book, the subtitle of it is, and I love this, and it became my mantra. I want to die young at an old age. Right. And when I looked at the heck with extended longevity, if the last 10 or 20 years of your right. life is miserable and you're sick, you know, I, I want I want my morbidity rate instead of being like this to be like this. I want to go to bed one night after having a great day. You and I have done an interview with me because you're checking in on me when I'm 107 years old or whatever. Right. I just had a busy, great day. And I just, it was my time. I die in my sleep. So all of that became a why and a driving, but it was really the 10,000 steps. I'm not perfect. I quote unquote cheat all the time mm -hmm. and it's okay. And that's the way I am. That's what works for me. Right. Wow. Um, I feel like every there were so many pearls in what you just said. Absolutely. Um, because you really have devoted uh, time to researching and um, finding out as much as you can about this and actually implementing it on yourself. Um, could you briefly describe your take and your understanding of the biological environmental factors that contribute to human longevity? Yes. I'll give you the foundation that I alluded to that when I really understood the why, and to me, it's been a major trend in medical research amongst people like uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick and Dr. David Sinclair and just a whole host of other people. And that is, is you know, we went through a period in the modern age, uh, let, so let's even say from the 1950 to now, where the emphasis was on treatment, first mm -hmm. of, as we all know, pharmaceuticals, you know, see this guy out digging clams on a beach and saying, hey, take this pill it's going to make you better. What? Five more clamps? Yep. Anyway, but it was on, it was on treatment and dealing with issues as opposed to upstream of it. Well, look, I mean, a lot of people are seeing that trend that it's all about not needing the dadgum pill or the treatment and everything and feeling great. 
And what I saw this emphasis on was the way we as a species in, evolved over hundred, well, the Homo sapiens 200,000 years, but quite frankly, you could go back to the first amoebas and how the fundamental basis for life and survival that, uh, you know, there are two purposes, one to survive in order to procreate. And when you look at Homo sapiens in, you know, the modern age, which is this much compared to right. being on Earth, all of this time we were stressed mm -hmm. and we were optimized for survival. So when we were in that physical stress, that's when our bodies actually optim optimized itself and healed itself. Uh, when we graze and eat food all the time, our cells replicate, 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 get damage, get damage, get damage. When we do something like fast, even just mm -hmm. intermittent fasting, our bodies, you know, the mitochondria down to the DNA, down to the telomeres, which keep your DNA from fraying, kind of like that mm -hmm. plastic on the end of your shoelace. It optimizes your body. When you do the hot, cold thermotherapy, thermogenesis, what it's doing is triggering, triggering your body to optimize. And you do autophagy. You get rid of about a third of your cells that are underperforming, damaged, or dead. On and on and on. And so then when you exercise, when you do aerobic exercise or strength training, that not only gives you good muscle tone and strength, and there's a difference between building muscles and building strength, but it triggers a multitude of other things in your body. That's the big thing. All of these things have all of these results that seemingly aren't even related to specifically what it is. Building more muscle mass means that as we get older, we stop, we slow down producing new blood vessels. You do some resistance training, it triggers an enzyme, something in your brain that triggers it, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So yes, our ancient primal ancestors were exposed to hot and cold environmental conditions. They were feast and famine. They were fasting. They were always working out. Uh, even right. the mental health things relate back to the way that we were. And so by getting back to that, that was that was me understanding why. And having that why when I didn't want to go to the gym, when I didn't right. want to turn cold in the shower, when like right now I'm in an intermittent fast. I finished dinner at 6.30 last night. And as soon as we're done, I'm going to eat lunch. It wasn't that hard. Uh, yeah, that that was that was the thing that that really did it. The, the second point that I'll make through all of this research, too, was that it doesn't take much. It doesn't take huge workout regimens. Uh, it doesn't take, you know, extremes to start having an immensely different impact on you right now. If you're 23 years old. It has an incredible impact, even though at 23, I was bulletproof. I thought I was in good shape. I bet I would have felt a hell of a lot better and performed a lot better back then. As you get older, now I'm seeing a couple of new recent studies showing that it's never too late. That if you're out of shape and you're 70 years old or 80 years old or 90 years old, mm. you start doing these things and you will benefit from them right. almost right away. I'm just going to repeat that. So it's never too late where I'm also going to uh, bring, bring over the research and I'm going to link it. Um, it's so important because uh, when, when I'm out training people and people consult with me, give me a call, I meet with them. Uh, it does certainly feel like after 70 people are, you know, I'm seeing that number after 70 people are telling me that, you know, it's too late. And it's so not true, especially not these days, right? 70 is so young these days. Oh, I mean, you know, you hear the expression 60s, the new 40. Right, right. Uh, I, I take the point, except 60s now the new 60, because everything else has changed. And and I'll go ahead and throw that in, you know, I that 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 part of what I'm doing is trying to you know, bring the awareness out, awareness out there of the new reality of what it is to be in, for lack of a better term, I don't even like this one, but let's say olderhood, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if, if you're thinking, oh, I'll retire at 62 and you've got 30 or 40 now, uh, you, right. you, you 
will live easily into your hundreds and active, fully mobile, on your own, doing something. By the way, that's the other thing I discovered that the number one precursor, the most fundamental thing that leads to good health is living a purposeful life, having a reason to get, you know, nothing kills like retirement. People lose their purpose. They lose their relevance and everything right. else. When you're doing something like I, what, what you're doing right now at your age, what I'm doing right now at my age, mm-hmm. it becomes two things. Number one, it's a prime motivator. I, right. I'm not going to be able to do this or enjoy it if I'm not in good health. Right. Pretty simple, but hugely true. Mm-hmm. But the second thing is, is that they're finding out is that the emotion and psycholo- psychological aspects of it actually because now they're finally coming around, they meeting medical researchers, the medical industry, whatever, is realizing that there is a brain, body, brain, stomach, brain, gut, brain, heart connection, mm-hmm. all connected in terms of what it does with your physiology and metabolism, emotions, stress, so on and so forth, negative stress. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, that that can happen at um, at amazingly, I mean, for your entire life, quite frankly. So decline, other than certainly there's some environmental and congenital issues that are outside of our control, but overall, even in a lot of those cases, people can improve their situation. So here's the thing, it's choice. It just comes down to you making the choice. How do I want to be and feel for the rest of my life, however long that is. Right. When you and I talked previously, um, I was telling you about uh, my version of what you were saying, the the why factor of writing down, asking why you want to do this and finding that true purpose of, and then answering the why, and then asking again and asking again and asking again until you really are at the core of why am I doing this? And um, purpose is extremely important for overall well-being, not necessarily happiness, but your overall well-being. Yeah, I I, uh, uh, and I think I mentioned to you. So I have an interview on my site with a guy named Paul Tasner uh, lives out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, at age 66, he became an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur, in fact. And um, he uh, he was approached by a major did one of those global holding firms that own all these you know all the insurance company a bunch of insurance companies okay. around the world. They they contacted him to maybe do some marketing, which didn't happen. But he was having a conversation with the two top researchers. Now, insurance companies are very quantifiably, specific, you know, they're looking at actuarial tables, you know, health, longevity. I mean, they're some of the best researchers for that kind of stuff that exists. And they're looking at it in very real terms. Mm-hmm. And they said to Paul Tasner, that by doing what he's doing and having this purpose, this aspiration, this sense of relevance and accomplishment, the contrast of working hard, taking time off, things of that sort, they said, Paul, according to our research and data, this is the number one thing you can have in order to have great health during your longevity. Having that purpose, that intent, that relevance, because Mm -hmm. you hear that when people retire and why I mean, retirement, traditional retirement, as we think of it, is very suitable for a lot of people. I honor that and acknowledge it. I know some of you. Congratulations. Godspeed. But for most of us, especially in this day and age, especially with what my generation grew up with, with that sense of relevance and change and making impact and stuff that Mm -hmm. really didn't exist before, all of that, you put it together. It's no wonder that you hear that such a common thing around the world has become that people first of all, don't really think through, what am I going to do with retirement? It's just, oh, I'll get to sleep in. Oh, I'll travel. Oh, I'll get my golf game. You know, and it's like, that's got a very short, relevant, you know, that's contrast to where you are right now. We go through all life of strategizing and planning, but we don't do that. We don't really think about that. And what happens is, is there's what a lot of people call the retirement honeymoon of about a year or so, where it's wonderful. Right. And then all of a sudden, 
there's depression and alcoholism and drug abuse and uh, divorce because your life has changed. You're not as relevant anymore. You're not as purposeful anymore. You don't have the contrast of working and going after something and taking time off. It doesn't mean anything to you anymore. And that's where we see the health declining too, because you lose that why. Right. Um, I just want to back up for a moment because you mentioned negative stress. And I, I just want to, it's kind of like a double backup. You mentioned negative stress. And then you also, before we were talking about the fact that longevity is linked to stress, basically, to us overcoming um, certain difficulties like working out and making the muscle work hard. We've got the micro tears uh, or the intermittent fasting. Um, and, and so could you talk a little bit more about what negative stress would be then versus that stress that we were talking about? Well, I, I, yeah, the, the, the stress I was talking about was distressing the bodies in very controlled and positive mm -hmm. ways. By the way, if you're older, I'm not saying this so that we don't get sued, but you really should check with your health care practitioner uh, because we're all different and there may be some things where it's like, hey, don't do that or don't go that far seriously. Right, right, right. But, Absolutely. But, you know, so there's the healthy stress of stressing your body in terms of fasting and you know, lifting your weights. That's stressing, you know, briskly walking. That's stressing your body. Mm -hmm. The negative stress, well, first of all, can be overdoing it uh, or doing something that you're not in the place of health to do it or to the degree that you are. But there, there, there's the stress of life. There's the stress of anxiety. There's the stress of depression. There's the stress of uh, old crap, you know, that we can't get rid of. And one of the things that I advocate with New Way Forward, which is all about, by the way, which is what I did. I'm like, what am I going to do with decades of healthy living ahead of me? What am I going to do next? And in researching, it's like, oh, this is what I'll do. I'll share this stuff with people. Right. But one of the things that I advocate, and I think we're seeing this too, and, and COVID accelerated because it's not just people my age or people who are, you know, approaching or in their 50s. I mean, it's people in their 30s and their 40s. That's some of my best engagement are, are people, you know, 40s and 50s, let's say. It's is going, wait a minute, what am I doing with my life? What's going on here? Is there something more? Is there something more right for me? Well, that's a very telling sign because they've kind of gotten to that point based on old beliefs that maybe aren't true anymore and beliefs lead to emotions, emotions lead to actions, actions lead to decisions, and that all adds up to where you are now. And when we get older, whatever that means, 39, 69, 89, whatever, we're at a point where sometimes it's a crisis when we can step back and say, what, what am I doing? Right. Or where, where did I, this come from or whatever? And I think those, that's, that's the core kind of stress. If I'm answering your question correctly, that's yeah. a, it, it just eats at us. Mm -hmm. And this morning with, I had to do a, I still have some clients in my content creation business. I had to do something this morning. Why was I so worried and therefore having all sorts of cortisol and negative stuff happening to me physiologically, you know, and it's like, oh, it's this thing that I finally figured out and I just need to keep addressing it so that it doesn't have this negative impact on me. I hope that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, I think checking in with yourself uh, and and the question of why am I constantly anxious? There is some kind of misfit in your life that has to be addressed. So it could be your workplace. It could be a certain relationship. Um, but yeah, that's that's exactly how I would think of negative stress. It's it's this kind of misfit. And uh, there's this sense of mindfulness that can help you identify, just kind of checking in with yourself and being honest with yourself. This is something I'm really focusing on right now. So, uh, and I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible. So, 
it, it, you have neuroscientists now, people like Dr. Tara Swart, for instance, uh, who wrote a book called The Source, you know, that's talking about why your brain does this. And so let's see how simple I could keep this. So when I talked about that formula that started with your beliefs, I think the vast majority of every human that's walked this planet has died with incredible self-limiting beliefs because of something that happened to them typically in childhood, and they applied that belief to the rest of their lives. And, and self-limiting is the word for it. So I can't make enough money. I can't hold down a relationship. I'm no good. Whatever. Something a parent mm -hmm. said, the way your parents were, whatever, or other things that happened. And so again, when you get older, again, when you want to get healthier and happier and more, more whatever, going, and, and I've had to do that for with myself. I'm still doing it. Why is it that I'm this way? Why is it I can't do this? Why is it that I worry about that? And it's literally asking yourself, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. When was the first time that happened? Some people instantly can tell you, well, my father, my mother, my life situation, whatever. And it's like, is that true now? Is that really true about you? I mean, you've got people like David Bear, and I can't remember the other woman's name, takes a little bit more of a new age approach for it, but it's still the same thing. It's like, you know shine a light on that and realize and and think about yourself as is that still really true anymore and you've mm -hmm. gone 80 percent of the way to get re getting rid of it right the second, the second thing is is i'm a big believer in the power of intention that time i talked about 17 years ago came about by doing the power of intention without knowing it. i was doing it you think of anything in your life you've changed it because you envisioned and believed in uh and uh, visualized what you wanted and you got it. So there's a spiritual component to it, to many people, uh, alignment with the universe, God, whatever you want to call it. But there is a neurological thing. Your, your uh, amygdala, which is the brain processor, it's your Intel chip in your brain and something called the reticular activating system. That was a primal defense mechanism. You would start to recognize things you needed to recognize in order to survive. You know, mm -hmm. that grass, that tall grass is moving over there. That's either a deer to eat or a saber tooth tiger to eat me. Your brain looks for things to support what you believe. It mm -hmm. will look and select. When you go on Facebook or a new site, what makes you pick things out to look at and not look at all? Do you, mm -hmm that does. So conversely, if you want to change it, I love the way Tara Swart, Biber, actually, she's remarried now, phrases it, is you have to create new neural pathways. By the way, they used to think neural pathways stop growing when you're in your 20s. The fact is, anytime you learn something new or whatever, if you're 900 years old, you right. grow a neural pathway. So what you start doing is, is that you start overcoming those old ones. And by visualizing what you want, by pursuing and believing in what you want to figure out or think or overcome, you start growing new neural pathways and your reticular activating system starts looking for those patterns to support that. That's why when I have an intention to not need more money, but to have this, and this is what it's going to be like, stuff like that. I create those neural pathways. It starts looking for it. Same thing with your health, you know? I know my why, I know the what, and I need to find the how, and mm -hmm. I'm going to look like this, I'm going to feel like this, I'm going to be like this, you start, that's what happened to me without me even knowing it, and you start creating those, but here's, here's the end cap, and that is, is that what she says is, imagine you're in a meadow of tall grass, and there's no path, and every day you start walking that same place, Right. all of a sudden you've created Yes. Path. That's such a good metaphor for that. That is so it is. I love on. It. It's on yeah. my vision board. <laughs> that path. I love yeah, it. yeah. That's that's gonna stay with me. That's definitely gonna stay with me. Um, and yeah, neuroplasticity is, you know, relevant at any point and paving that path. I I think of I used to think of it as um uh waterbeds because when we think, when we try to get over old habits, right, we still have those pathways, but we can dry them up. So 
we don't, we have a different uh, path where that we've paved and the water's going through that new path. And those old pathways have now dried up. But then people who, for instance, have addicted, addictive issues might want to be really careful with the old habits or in general uh, habits. Habits are those pathways. And so we want to be careful because they're still there. Just the water's not flowing there right now. But yeah, you can keep creating new pathways. I, I hope I hope we got a second for this. There was a woman named Portia Nelson. Yes. I, and I heard this secondhand from somebody else that, that was recounting it. And it was something where it's like your five stages of life or something you were supposed to write down briefly on a note card. And here's what she did. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. She's like, here's how I describe my five phases of life. I'm walking down the street. I'm walking down the street. There's a big pothole. I fall into it. Next stage of life. I'm walking down the street. There's a big pothole. I try to walk around it, but I still fall off <laughs> into it. You know, I'm walking down the street. I get to the other side of the street, but I almost fall down to it. I can't remember the fourth one, but the fifth one is I'm go down a different street. Right, right, right. right. And that's just, you know, and so you're right. I mean, we could say, oh, I'm, I'm changing this habit. You know, I'm not doing drugs anymore. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes. But we're still walking around it. You right. know, we're still inside of it. It's like, yeah. no, you got to go down a different street. You have to have, create that pathway, that trail in the meadow. And like maybe put some pra- paving stones on it and some guardrails. I mean, just right to, to just <laughs> get the bulldozer and just plow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> Paul, I, uh, I uh, a few months ago, I had a mindfulness workshop. And, um, oh, the topic was self-compassion and self-love. And I opened it up with, (laughs) I opened it up with the Portia Nelson poem. So you, yeah, I hope I got it okay. You, I love the way you brought it. I love it. I love that. Okay. Lovely. Um, so besides medical advancements, um, and we can get into that, I'm interested in discussing specific science-based lifestyle tools that you contribute to longevity, which you've already mentioned. Um, but if you want to, uh, get into it a little bit more specifically, like really handing out tools, I'd love us to mention a few. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, You've discussed intermittent fasting, working out. Right. I, I think it, it, it's a lot of mine is is almost more conceptual, although it's backed by science and it and it's practical. It, one thing is is the practicality of it. You got to be practical. You know this thing about I'm going to the gym for next month and I'm going to hit five days a week and yeah, that's not going to work. So some of my practical terms is that is upstream of that. So I mentioned one of them. It's really knowing the why. My why is I want to die young at an old age. And also the why, the things that I'm supposed to do to do that are so that it makes sense to me. Then I really go to uh, James Clear's Atomic Habits. So I look at what's, what's, you know, going to the gym, like, one day last week, I really didn't want to go. I really, really didn't want to go. Uh, and I know to focus on the first 1%. So even when I say, you know, I'm going to go to the gym for a month for five days a week. Okay, fine. You set a goal. But what you need to do is focus on the 1%. My focus on my 1% is to go upstairs and get my gym back. And then what's the next one percent? Next one, and even and I even said if I show up for thirty minutes, good job. Totally. And, but of course, I'm not or uh, I'm not going to show up for just thirty minutes. Or Tim Ferriss, if, if you know who he is, the Four Hour Work Week, Tools of Titans, his stuff's up there. Um, he has written this huge book. He hates to write. His goal is two crappy pages of copy every morning. You know, <laughs> some days that's it. So you have to make it doable. That's why I said I took 10,000 steps. 
And it really, you know, it's really simple. You know, by doing some resistance training, by doing some aerobics every day, uh, BJ Fogg uh, is also this micro habits diet. He, he, you wouldn't know it looking at, I do 50 push ups a day. He does it every time he goes to the bathroom. He does five push ups. You know, so what does that do? Well, in the first place, it gets you going in that habit. One, all of a sudden, five is easy, and so on and so forth. So I, I really see it as that progression. But I would, you know, what I recommend is, you know, the intermittent fasting, which means, as I said, I it, it, I go 6.30 to 6.30 p.m. to noon, two days a week. Uh, there's also 5.2 fasting where two days a week, uh, or two days a week, you uh, men have 600 calories and women 500. It's actually not that hard. Uh, and I still, you know, was able to eat the food that I wanted. The resistance training, building strength and also building speed. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons why people fall when they get older and have the fall to begin with is because they've lost their fast twitch muscle mm -hmm. ability. So they can't mm -hmm. catch themselves or they're too slow in reacting and then they fall. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I mean, by the way, there are a thousand things like that. Um, the autophagy, uh, half a mile shower yeah. is in, is in, cool water and then i do some cold spray well, the more you do it the more uh uh you get used to it and you focus on the why um, i'm smiling because um that's my weak spot and i've already talked about it uh i had dr ludmilla schaefer who is um a brilliant oncologist i had her on this podcast and uh she was talking about rewiring yourself and I, I was saying, you know, I, I have to get into a, an ice bath one day. I mean, I'm, I'm friends with someone who runs ice bath workshop. I am deathly afraid <laughs> of getting into, and you're telling me, you're sitting here and telling me that this is like part of what you do, the hot cold shower. And <sighs> I'm not quite a hot bath guy though. And certainly the cryogenic things. No, that's too far from me. But for instance, I mean, again, you know, being half my shower, being in kind of cold water, not like this, right, but, right. But then doing that, and I do it on my face, the vagus, the vagus nerve, which goes through a bunch, you know, a lot of your body and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just because I found trusted sources, people who I thought were reasonable and smart and 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 trusted. You know, and it was explaining you want to do that because this happens. Well, right. I, Sure as hell want that to happen. So, okay, I'll give it a go. Or when I go to the gym, we got a sauna. And um, uh, when I get out of the sauna, I go straight into the men's locker room, which is right next door, go straight into the shower. And, you know, I have to start with a little bit of kind of cool water, but then I do, you know, 10 seconds, warm it up a little bit, 10 seconds. Wow. See, that even sounds so hard to me. I have, but I think you're, I think you're my official inspiration. Oh, thank you very much. Do I thank get a you. Um, and we'll by the way, see, we'll see. Let me try. It. I'll let you know. <laughs> what I have found, by the way, uh, uh, is two things. One, when I first started doing it, the first one, it was really, the first time I did this was really hard. And then by the third one, you know, it wasn't so hard. Over time, the right. more I did it, the more I just got used to it. I'm no Win Hoff, if you know who Win Hoff is. Yeah, yeah, of course. Win the Ice Man. For 10 minutes. Um, but, you know, the benefits of it are huge. And I feel, feel the triggers in my head. I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you two triggers when I know it's really kicked in. And I, this is not scientifically proven. I've been meaning to look it up. I either have I'm either suddenly really hungry or mm. I feel like I got to go pee right away. I don't, you know, by the time it's over, both feelings are gone, but I figure something triggered. I don't know if you find that. Yeah, out, Well, the hormones are definitely going off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to let you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. 
I'm going to try it. <laughs> I, I, I expect I, I, I expect a, a, a report from you. Yeah, no, you, absolutely. But to sum up that question, and I mean, again, it's the why, yeah. you know, we all focus on the what and the how, but never the why. And it's all about the why, which determines what the what and the how is. And it right. also gives the meaning and impetus. And, you know, so so my my effort, you know, I thought it needed a name and I call it a new way forward because, again, mm-hmm. and I was at, at first, at first it was pro boomer. Well, Okay, bad choice. But it was really like I needed a new way forward for my life. I mm-hmm. needed to figure out and and put the effort into discovering and then executing a new way to live my life that because I was older, I knew more about myself, more about life, more about everything. And man, if I got 40, 50 years left, this is like a gift for me to actually probably for the first time in my life do really, really what was right for me, not to take anything wow. away from other careers or raising kids, which I wish I could do it again. I loved it so much. I think uh, some of it was challenging. Um, and so, I mean, that can be, a, a, again, a huge why for people, because if it's kind of like, well, I'm in a job I don't like, or blah, 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 or I, you know, whatever life situation that old beliefs kind of got you into, or the default life, well, I was supposed to do that. And you're all of a sudden going, whoa, 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 whoa. it's my turn now. Right. I get to do what I want to do and what's really right for me. And that's that environmental thing in, in the broadest context of it, that again, All of a sudden, it's like you want to feel good. You want to be healthy. You want to have the energy. You want, 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 want. And that's a huge success factor rather than, well, I'm supposed to eat better. I'm supposed to be in better shape. I'm supposed to fit into a a pair of 32-inch waist jeans or or whatever. And so, I I mean, I can't, it's, it's, it's all about, our existence on earth. It's all about this life and what we're going to do with it. Health's a big part of it that both contributes to it, but also has requirements from it. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, it also reminds me of when clients uh, show up super guilty, you know, with a guilty face and, and they say to me, I was bad. I've never said that to anyone. Why are you coming up to me? <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I'm a judge. No, I never, ever said you were bad or you were good. I mean, you're always good. You're always good. And and part of life is just, like you said, um, eat a lot of this, eat either no or little of this, and it's all good. And you don't have to look at the big picture. It's about the baby steps. And By yeah, the way, you bring up a huge point. That's brilliant on your part. Guilt, you know, cheating. Right. <laughs> What, you know, I've been gluten free and I haven't been eating processed foods or red meat and everything. Last night I had a cheeseburger and some fries and a chocolate milkshake. Okay, fine. Right. Okay. okay. You know, and 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 the guilt thing is a deterrent. Absolutely. We don't want to feel guilty. So we just say, screw it. Right. I'm not gonna, the way I'm not guilty is I won't try. And there's no reason to be guilty about it. You know, I I cheat, mm-hmm. but I'd say that I'm 83.2% being humorous there, good. And that's good enough. And good enough is good enough. Right. And, <laughs> you know, overall, obviously, you know, it's been beneficial for me because I in no way, shape or form, other than when I look in the mirror, perceive my age physically or mentally or emotionally or whatever. And so, yeah, I mean, just showing up. You know, I see people at the gym that are in terrible shape and they might just be sitting there just, uh, you know, doing this and not even doing it long. And you know what my reaction is? Man, you showed up. You showed up. Good for you because that, and even that was healthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, So let's talk about the steps and, and we'll be a little bit more, um, we're going to be a little bit more tangible. Maybe the steps individuals can take to optimize, uh, the chances, uh, right. We don't, we, we don't know what our destiny is or what, what's planned for us or whatever you want to call it. 
But um, what can we do uh, to optimize the chances of living a longer, healthy life? Um, and I think I'm also because we've been talking about tools, but I think let's let's also maybe um, talk to the younger and the older listeners or maybe use this to sum up everything that we've been talking about. Yeah, and, and you're meaning like like tangible steps of how I could maybe uh, get started or- Get started, gotcha. yeah. Okay, well, okay, first of all, let's talk about age. I physically and holistically feel better now than I did pretty much for my entire adulthood. I sure as hell wish I had felt this way when I was in my 30s or 40s or 50s. So how's that for one reason? But the other thing is, is that, <clears throat> you know, I started late. If you're starting now, fill in the blank of what age it is. Mm -hmm. Just imagine what the benefits are going to be for you long term. And so there and yet by the same token, if you're a lot older than I am, it's not too late to start. Right. You have to know you. you I would almost start with the question of how. How do I do this so that it works for the way that I am? Don't compare yourself to anyone else. Comparisons suck mm -hmm. in so many ways, and we do it all the time. You're not them, or people who, you know, look at that. I wish I could be like her or him. Right. And then you really come to find out, oh, thank God I'm not like they are. Right. But 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 when it comes to this, we're all different. So by the way, talking to a knowledgeable health practitioner such as you, um, can really help because you understand it and they can, if they're any good and they're really taking you into account rather than, you know, follow this routine and you're right. really, no, that's BS. That is BS. What you really want to do is be smart about it. And it's up to you. You are in total control of this. Right. My 10,000 steps was, first of all, doing baby steps. I wasn't going to try to radically change everything and be perfect and do all this other kind of stuff. I just started eating more of this and less of that. I, I heard somebody say, if you're going to eat some meat, treat it like a side rather than the entree. And living in the United States, we get too big, big of portions. I was leaving food on my plate, all that kind of stuff. And, and so it was taking the baby steps in that and the same thing with the working out and the same thing with the aerobic exercise, you know, so I know I can't go running. And by the way, running actually, I'm going to tell you, is really bad for you. It's bad for your body. It's bad for your physiology and, and so on and so forth. And now they're discovering that like our primal selves, that intermittent doing it intermittently. Like, like what I do is uh, I've in five minutes on a stationary bat bike, I go as hard as I can, fast as I can for 20 seconds, wait and do it again. I do it five times in five mm -hmm. minutes. That gives me better aerobic performance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. jogging for 18 miles. Right, so right, right. That's that, it. That's high intensity interval training. Yeah. Well, I call it shit for short, high intensity interval training, but anyway, <laughs> I hope I can say that. You can um, say that. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, some days when I don't have too long to work out and everything, I do that. And then I keep going and I'll just say, I'm just going to tone, not tone. I'm going to do a lot of reps and I'm going to keep my heart rate up for 30 minutes, you know, at 120. Yeah. And, and I mean, so there are all sorts of ways, but, but I guess the point I'm coming to is, is that I knew that I wasn't that super disciplined, perfect person. And I had to do everything in baby steps and, you know, just a little bit better every day, um, uh, going a little bit farther, learning a little bit more. Uh, and and now, you know, like I cut out 90 percent glutens because I understood, you know. So, by the way, I highly recommend that glutens and lectins. We did not evolve eating and it causes leaky gut, which causes inflammation. And now what they're saying is, is that the root cause of things like Alzheimer's, dementia, autoimmune diseases, heart disease, many cancers, even diabetes is because of the amount of inflammation in your body. Your body fighting the infection from a leaky gut caused by glutens, glutens and We're going to we're going to link uh uh to the research on the podcast page. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. Good for you. And so what do I do? You know, well, okay, I I have some bread uh, uh, that's not made from any wheat or grain. You know, um, mm-hmm. I, it's not ideal, but I've gotten used to it and it's fine because I know my why. And then also uh, you get mm-hmm. you know, gluten selectin and so nitrate vegetables uh, or fruits, actually, uh, you know, like uh, eggplant, tomatoes, um, uh, cucumbers, peppers, things like that. However, they're in the skin and in the seeds. You get rid of those and you're fine, or you eat it on a limited basis. So I use that as kind of an example of different techniques that I've done. You know, it's also studying up on certain supplements. Uh, there's still a lot of controversy out there about how effective they are or they aren't. I rely on people like, what's David Sinclair taking? What's Rhonda Patrick taking? You know, if you mm-hmm. if you've ever watched a Dr. Rhonda Patrick uh, podcast, it's like taking organic chemistry because she gets right. in the studies, always yeah. the studies, always the studies, always the research, always the verifiable stuff. She will. She's the first to tell you omega three. <laughs> I grow my own broccoli sprouts in order to get the sulforaphane. I put it in a healthy shake every other morning, blah, blah, blah. So I think the fasting is huge. Doing some resistance strength training, even if it's just in your house, doing some push-ups, even if it's on your knees or a wall push. Absolutely. I mean, they, they, you can go on YouTube and you can even say, light resistance training or exercises for people over of this age or whatever. And the beauty is, again, once you get going, you get the momentum to do more. So those two things, sleep, hydration, um, and then you, as you talk, of course, you know, the mindfulness, you know, I, I get up at five o'clock every morning minimally. Now I actually am just naturally waking up a little earlier and I built a morning routine that was all about me, you know, that was hydration, that was meditation, yoga, and journaling. I look forward to getting up at five o'clock in the morning. Mm. That's my time. And what I'm also doing is priming my mind and my body and my emotions and everything else to perform at my best during that day. Right. I hope that if you got some more specifics, I'm I'm okay. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, there is something specific, but I just want the, the habit of giving yourself what you need when it's time, hydration, moving your body, uh, actually ends up not only benefiting you, <laughs> but the people around you. <laughs> Cause yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there, you have a lot more patience. <laughs> you can, you can, um, definitely contain a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, the father of mindfulness, the Western mindfulness as we know it, um, as we know it in the West, <laughs> is the, talks about how when we cultivate patience um, and we do that through mindfulness, we are so much kinder to the people around us who we love most and who we can lose our patients with the most. So it sounds like just exactly what you said, priming yourself, preparing for what's coming. And the, I feel like it's priceless. I really do. You obviously, I, I figure you know who Dr. Andrew Wheel is because he was one of the first people to start breaking through in this realm. And and I he probably has a name for it that I can't remember but a, a breathing technique that he says is proven to work. Right. Uh, and and it's it's almost like box breathing, but what it is, is it's a noisy four seconds in, mm-hmm. a seven second hold, and then an eight, eight. second. Right. Breathe. It actually, over time, alters, and you, you can answer this much better than I am. I'm getting it over my head. Uh, uh, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system that deals with the very reactions you're talking about. It balances your brain, right? Oh yeah. And um, specifically the four, seven, eight that you're talking about. um, I used to be addicted to falling asleep with it. 
Oh, I, yeah. I try that. Thank you. Yeah, I would I would lie down and I would just get because it um it's very, very calming. Four, seven, eight. So you inhale for four, you hold for seven, and you exhale for eight. And so because you're exhaling for eight, you want to do it uh slowly and almost like restricting the way you're exhaling, right? So it's can you hear me? <laughs> kind of like a like a whisper hum. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, 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 what, what we're talking about here to sum it up for everybody is that we lose sight of what some of the most critical basics are. We take them for granted. It's understandable, but sleep, quality sleep mm-hmm. being one of them. Um, mm-hmm. Number two, hydration. You know, when I chug down a bunch of water, when I first wake up in the morning before the coffee, but the coffee's great. You know, when I chug that water down, Within moments, I you can't feel it technically, but you notice the difference in your brain because you've lost, what is it, 16, 18 ounces of hydration when you sleep. You sleep. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that's affected by dehydration is your brain, which is mostly fat and water and stuff. Um, and uh, breathing is the other one. We do not breathe well at all. And when we get in stress, it's short breaths because Mm -hmm. stress used to be a saber tooth tiger chasing us. You needed that kind of reaction. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that I do is um, that I find just works amazingly well is um, uh, what I learned doing uh, birthing classes with Kim before our boys were born. And they called it a deep cleansing breath, which is literally, I got to turn away from the camera and I go... (laughs) <laughs> or just and just letting it go it out and i mean man it's a rush because you just you didn't know how tense you were until you did that and you can just feel it go mm. yeah so the breathing the um the by the way i also just one more thing about the breathing um I was working with an, uh, a group from all over the world. They invited me to talk to them. They were here for uh, doing their MBA in a very, very, very competitive program that was done in one year. And wow. they, you know, they selected people from all over the world to come there. And I'm, they invited me to talk to them because they were so stressed. <laughs> so I, we talked about mindfulness and we were talking about stress and attention. And the thing I said that the tool that you can walk around with anywhere, anywhere you go, you is your breath and you can just pull it out of your toolbox. And even when you're in traffic and someone's honking and those, those little triggers that can absolutely drive you crazy, just get into what, you know, you can also Google it. It's, you can do the box breathing. You can do the four, seven, eight, you can do exactly what you just showed me that. And then just letting it go. You know, it's all, uh, it's actually amazing, powerful techniques that you can use anytime. So yeah, you know, two, 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 two quick things that I can't help myself that I no, add please. To that is that with with that that first of all that stress reduction that's what it's doing. In the first place, we did, and you know better than I. Certain physiological things happen with taking in that air, but mm-hmm. the other thing is psychological, mindful, or whatever mm-hmm. is that it it's it is distracting you. It is disengaging you from the real thing. I mean, you know, Eckhart Tolle. You know, he's like, you know, when you're in in that place, whatever that place is, stop for a moment and feel the life in your right hand. Mm. Right. You know, and it's just breaking that cycle. Yeah. Or I'll do a moment of gratitude. And I've done it behind behind the wheel. It's like, okay, a moment of gratitude. Wow, that's a really pretty tree. You ever really look at a tree? You know, yeah. something like that. It 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 breaks you from that cycle. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, by the way, uh, really uh, important. Yeah, it, it, towards that in on Omega Steel, something called Yoga Nidra, if you've ever heard of that. And what that is, is lying on your back. And it, it's, I think it's best to do it, find a guided uh, meditation on YouTube or something like mm-hmm. that to follow. And uh, what it fundamentally is, is, is that you, without moving, you're scanning your body, you're feeling your little finger on your right hand. Mm-hmm without moving anything you're feeling this da, 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 da. one one time years ago when i was first getting into this i was having just a super stressful day and getting ambushed i mean heart rate up copper taste in my mouth shallow breath i and i'm like oh my gosh this is what i was trying to get away from and i took a moment and did that yoga nitra and i went from that i'm going to stroke out have a heart attack to literally felt feeling like I had taken a couple of Valium. I don't mean I was relaxed. I had a Valium buzz. Right. If I literally had taken two pills of that completely changed everything in my body. And then I was like, okay, let's go deal with this crap. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Take out the garbage too. I totally, totally agree with that. That's that's what the four seven eight. Does. Yeah, that's had that's the same feeling. Oh yeah. Oh, thank running. you. It's changing the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system response. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, exactly. Um. So wow, uh, <laughs> we I feel like we've summed up tools you brought forth. Uh, important names, by the way, I'm going to uh, write this down also so that people have it in front of them uh, in the podcast uh, uh, page. You talked about David Sinclair. You talked about Rhonda Patrick. I'm going to put that in there. Um, I'm also going to link to New Way Forward, which you. is your platform where basically, if I if I'm understanding this correctly, you are bringing forth information about health, well-being, longevity, uh, and it's it's basically acts kind of as a guide. Am I correct? Yes, I, I would say it, it's it's first of all, here's the new reality. Here's the new way of thinking. Here are the new possibilities as we get older, whatever the hell that means, whatever age you are. Uh, it's a different way to look at it and different way to imagine the possibilities. Then uh there's a section on passion and purpose with the experts in the, in that field. There's income as we all need it, but what if it was a way to earn an income that aligned with my new way forward, what I really wanted with my life, the health and well being, I must admit right now on the site is very, very lame. Um, I'm also on medium uh, where I'm getting more of it in, but uh, uh yeah, I'm still in launch mode to uh, to get a lot of that stuff. And and best place to follow me on social is on LinkedIn. Yeah, which is which I have to say, oh, yeah. please, please follow Paul Long on LinkedIn because um, it's rejuvenating to follow you. Well, thank you. And by the way, I want to throw out another name. I don't know if you're connected to him or not. Scott Fulton. Um, what is S C O T T and then Fulton mm-hmm. F U L T O N. The guy is amazing. He used to work for, he was a data guy with Dow Chemical. And then he started getting into this thing. I mean, he makes me look like a first grader. Uh, and he is sharing two or three or four times a day just the latest thinking, the latest science, the latest realities. Mm-hmm. So he's now a professor in Virginia, and uh, uh, his if, he if, if if people are really really into this stuff, he is a great person to follow. Beautiful, and and also the sense of community of of saying you know follow this person, follow it's it, Isn't it great. <laughs> it's so great, and it adds to our sense of purpose and our togetherness and our relationships, which also is so, so beneficial to our physical and mental health. So thank you for what you are doing and for being you. Thank you.
Oh, I'll have to tell my wife you said that. Thank you for <laughs> It's recorded. <laughs> recorded. <Hey. laughs> All right, Paul, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.